Hello, everybody. Welcome to this rather dark, wet night in Paris for what I hope will be an evening of really luminous conversation. Certainly, it's going to include some luminous imagery. Um, this is an evening that's going to be dedicated to Matisse and Matisse's books. It's in company with Louise Rogers Lalori, with whom I'm absolutely delighted to welcome back into the space of ULIP, although admittedly we're not in ULIP. Um, we are both in the Paris area, um, but the circumstances being such as they are at the moment, this conversation is going to be happening entirely through MS Teams Live. And that has a certain number of consequences, one of which is that we don't really know exactly how many people are listening to us. Um, and that can be somewhat off-putting. So I really want to stress that we have a Q&A function. Um, you should be able to post questions, comments at any point through this conversation. And I'd really encourage you to do that. And actually, if possible, to even use your name. Um, some of you, I think, out there are probably people that we know or people that we've encountered in through other kind of social media platforms as well. And it's just really nice to have a sense of who we're engaging in this conversation with. And we really would like to hear you through the Q&A function. So I'll be picking up on some comments, some questions as they come. Um, and Louise and I will be talking for about an hour, I think, this evening. Um, we could talk probably for hours and hours, but I think that's about the length of time um, that, uh, that this sort of interaction is, uh, is, 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 is pleasant for everybody concerned, shall we say. So with no further ado, I just want to say a few comments about how, um, how absolutely immensely pleased I am to be engaged with this conversation and with this book. Um, it's, a, it's the end of a long process. I first met Louise, I think, about 13 years ago and very much through, the, through conversations about Matisse. Um, and it's been just an amazing privilege to see the evolution of this work over that period of time. So Louise is a, a, a prolific translator and now author. Um, she has worked in all sorts of contexts, primarily through um, translations for national museums, for the Pompidou, for the Louvre, but also as an independent literary translator. She is the translator of 10 novels of fiction, which span a number of genres, from crime to history to literary novels, one of which had, was, had was a, a really substantial success in 2013, which was The President's Hat by Antoine Laurent. Um, so Louise brings a, a, you know, a, very, a very solid experience as a translator to this work. And I think we're going to be talking a little bit about how translation has informed her practice and the work she's produced, this wonderful book that you can, that you can see on the slide at the moment, Matisse, the books. But I also want to emphasize that this is a real departure within her, within her corpus of translated works. And it's just an amazing expanse, I think, of work that we have in the context of this book that goes right back to an MPhil thesis that she did at the University of London Institute in Paris. Um, and that has then just grown and grown and become this really wonderful thing that we want to share with you this evening. So we're going to start with Louise talking a little bit about the context in which Matisse's books were made, um, giving a sort of a background to the material that's in this book that she has just published, um, giving a little bit of a sense as well as to how it connects with the contemporary events, um, including an exhibition at the Pompidou Centre, which has just opened. That little introduction that Louise is going to give will be associated with some images, and we may bring some of those images back again later. They're just to give you a bit of a flavor for this, for this work, um, and then we'll pick up with the conversation. So, over to you, Louise. Thank you very much. Um, I should tell everybody that you're being very modest. Um, Anna Louise was actually the uh, supervisor of the thesis that, that grew in, into this book played really a, a key role in, in its genesis and so I, I can't thank her enough and I'm really delighted to be talking about the book with her now. Um, it seems entirely right that this should be the first um, public outing, if you like, for the, for the book. Um, <laughs> so um, by way of a short introduction and a bit of scene setting, um, I'll read my, my text. Matisse's books span 18 years, beginning with the poems of Stéphane Mallarmé, published in 1932. That book apart, all are the product of confinement, due in this case to the outbreak of World War II and the artist's recovery from life-saving surgery in 1940. Poetry and line drawing filled Matisse's often sleepless nights and brought creative consolation when he was bedridden and frequently in pain. His books capture the private disciplines of drawing, 
calligraphy or paper cutting, reproduced as etchings, lithographs, lino cuts, stencils, born of his obsession with lime, something he describes in a letter to his daughter Marguerite in 1942 as one of the greatest efforts of my life and one of the reasons why I determined to continue. Two poets in particular resonated with Matisse's own circumstances. In 1941, Pierre de Ronsard is discussed in letters to an old art school friend, André Rouvert. Food is scarce, electricity is rationed, but, Matisse says, Ronsard is constantly at my side. He sings his song in every key, every register, and I must do something with it. His collection of Ronsard's love poems, published in 1948, opens with a sonnet that expresses moral and physical exhaustion and the inspiration and renewal that reading and creative expression can bring in dark and difficult times. By October 1942, Matisse writes that he is in intimate conversation with the 15th century warrior bard Charles d'Orléans, himself a literal prisoner of war, captured by the English at Agincourt and writing his poems in the Tower of London. The letters to Rouvert highlight what the two friends seek from their wartime reading. I've given up on François Mauriac, Matisse writes, a nest of vipers indeed. It will only make us miserable and to no good purpose. And he signs off, oh les coeurs, hearts high. Rouvert replies, there's no use speculating about what might happen next. We must be patient. Spectate events with intense emotion by all means, but keep calm and wait. Referring to Matisse's studio apartment in Simiez overlooking Nice, he notes, you are the sovereign of all you survey from your windows. Truly, this will help. In December 1942, Rouvert retreats from his own lodgings on the Côte d'Azur to a tiny room in an auberge in the remote village of tourette sur loup You can call me there, he tells Matisse, and he gives him the telephone number, three. Matisse replies with a poem by Charles d'Orléans, En la chambre de ma pensée, in which the poet revisits private treasures in the bedchamber of his thoughts and arms himself against what he calls bothersome company. I'm sending you this poem for your cell wall, Matisse writes. Read these lines attentively and in good faith, ten times against the tax of gloom or melancholy. Au liqueur. Rouvert replies, your letter and the beautiful protective poem served their purpose fully. Woke at 2 a.m. in wild animal panic for lack of air, opened the window wide, opened the door wide, then managed to sleep at dawn after a night of insomnia. Read your letter, read your letter and its precious comfort again. A great help through this, made it to the light of day at last. The beautiful protective poem with its plea for self-care is the closing work in Matisse's setting of Charles, Charles's poésie, the last book published in Matisse's lifetime in 1950. It may come as no surprise then that in 2020, during lockdown, images of Matisse at work on his books, in bed, in the early years of the war and subsequently, have been widely shared on social media. Equally, that the books themselves should now feature prominently in the Centre Pompidou's 150th birthday tribute, Matisse Like a Novel, which has just opened after France's national confinement. Thank you so much, Louise, for bringing all of that, and particularly those, those um, letters so those letters written in the in the dark of the night or in the in the daybreak and that sense of relief from the night um between these two close friends and i think one of the things that i remember so clearly about your work was the way the work that you did during the, the thesis preparation was the way in which those um those letters came to be such a sort of source for understanding the slow mm. genesis um and i think you know it would be really interesting to kind of hear you talk a little bit more about that but before we get to that, I just want to take the time and perhaps slightly the indulgence as well to kind of, you know, just to hold this book. I mean, we're trying to show you some, some <laughs> images on screen, but I want to hold this object because I've been holding this object a lot and I'm kind of waving it in front of the camera in a rather Very clumsy heavy. way um, <laughs> because it is really quite heavy and it's mm -hmm. really quite huge and it's just an amazing thing. And it's just been such an incredible pleasure to have to carry this book with me over the past while um you know i said this makes it sound like a um a, a, you know a, a, a charge a, a a work and there is you know work in the process of, of of getting to grips with this book quite literally um but i think it's just such restorative work 
And in the context where we're so often at the moment, you know, flitting through pages, dealing with so much online activity, uh, responding to prompts and notifications, the slowness and the heaviness and the page, the, 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 the possibility of moving from one page to the next, backwards and forwards through this volume, has just been a really wonderful thing. And I think, so I just want to start with that sense of trying to bring the kind of book as object into this conversation, despite the fact that we are doing it through these digital means and, and mm -hmm. limited to the two dimensional screen. And just ask you to say something a little bit, first of all, perhaps about how the books that gave rise to Matisse's books came into his hands. You know, what was the kind of conditions of circulation of the books that Matisse started with in this process of making his own books? Well, he's drawing very much on, on um, classic, to begin with, with, from classic poets in the French canon. So um, Pierre de Ronsard, who's the 16th century court poet, um, author famously of, of you know, the Amour um, series of love poems dedicated to, to different muses. Um, and uh, subsequently Charles d'Orléans as well. Um, I mean, these are poets who are, who are extremely well known in French. Um, Louis Aragon, who is Matisse's chronicler in, in the book um, from which the Centre Pompidou retrospective takes its title, um, Henri Matisse au Roman. Uh, he actually um, writes about how as a schoolboy, um, he read Charles d'Orléans at school and um, wrote, actually wrote a, a four act play, as you do when you're when you're aged about 10 and you're Louis Aragon, um, all about Charles d'Orléans in the Tower of London as well. So that, I think, situates, you know, where these poets are in the in, in the French national consciousness um, during the war. Matisse is um, can't get out and about himself due to his own confinement, due to illness. And, and he he writes to Rouvert, sending him out on little missions along the Côte d'Azur to different bookshops, looking for this or that edition of the poems. Um, and eventually he, he, he sources what he needs. Um, and then he, he quite literally cuts them up, um, cuts out the text, sticks it down and, and you know, does his own um, page layout and draws his drawings around the, the lines of the poems. Um, to create his own um, reworking of these these very you know central corpuses in French literature, really. Um, I mean, they they're on a sort of parallel status with you know Shakespeare's sonnets or the metaphysical poets or you know it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's what. And I, I remember those kind of those exchanges where he says things like you know these are the works we need uh, now, and he's sort of you know there's this idea of this kind of shared purpose in this you know, bringing these books to one another, sending the poems backwards and forwards to one another, which um, between Matisse and Rouvain, which was very striking in the letters. Um, mm -hmm. But they weren't difficult to get hold of, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't difficult. Uh, well, no, they're, you know, they're, they're classic, um, widely available um, poems from the French canon. Um, what Matisse does ask Rouvain to do at one point is find a particular edition of, of um, Ronsard, which presents the poems in a a new and unusual order. And he says at one point that he thinks he would like to use that order in his own book. And Rouvert slaps him down very firmly and says, you know, don't be silly. What we want is Matisse's own take on these poems and, and his own reordering of them. And so really um, equivalent to the sort of reordering Shakespeare's sonnets to create a new narrative. You know, that, that's what he actually does with Ronsard's poems. Um, in, and because they're so well known in French, the fact that he has reordered them into a narrative of his own is, is immediately obvious to, to, to anyone who's, who's read Ronsard um, prior to coming to Matisse's setting of it. Yeah, and I think that's also the case for the Baudelaire, right? I mean, you, you, you talk really interestingly in the book about the choice of poems and precisely that process of ordering with the Baudelaire, with the Mallarmé as well. Is that correct? Um, uh, but Baudelaire and are slightly different cases. Um, they're, they're very much um, set in a, a, a particular sequence um, and he respects that sequence. But what Matisse does in each case actually um, is reinsert into both the Malamé and the Baudelaire very um, controversial and shocking poems that were banned after their first publication. Um, mostly with you know explicit or very violent or, or what might be deemed to be very misogynistic content um, and Matisse puts them back in um, 
and engages with them visually as well. Um, and I, really, I think as as part of his, um, well, in the name of, I think, freedom of speech and, and non-censorship, um, and, you know, to, 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 to challenge conven conventions of acceptability, I think, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is what he was doing in his painted uh, for, you know, his whole life long. Yeah. So this this idea of kind of really kind of re almost reconfiguring the text through this engagement, both with the image, but also with the form of the book, taking the book as a whole. I think one of the mm -hmm. things that's really fascinating about the way you've approached this work is to resist that idea that these are illustrations, but rather to kind of really, you know, uh, open up that the, this this concept of the reconfiguring of these absolutely canonical texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. In the in 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 um, in Ronsard, Aragon um, comments that you know perhaps we will read Ronsard differently after Matisse and, and certainly superficially in in his edition of, of Ronsard there 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 is everything that Ronsard is famous for you know his his hymning of the female form his celebration of the beauties of nature of flowers and so on but Matisse um, presents him and and you know creates a narrative in his poems, um, out of which Ronsard himself really doesn't emerge very well, it has to be said. He, uh, he, he really comes across as something of a coercive controller in, in, in modern terms. Um, and Matisse, you know, takes that head on, I think, in, in, his, in his setting of the poems. Okay. So was Ronsard the first of the Matisse books that you, uh, that you encountered? Can you tell us something about how you came to this work and how you kind of quite literally were able to consult it and work with it? Um, well, I, I first encountered it, um, as I say in the preface to the book, um, while I was still at Cambridge and um, studying art history, we were often told to keep little personal collections of postcards as, as you know, um, prompts of things that we, we have seen in real life and you know, so that we can keep a sort of record of what we've what seen. And I was looking through a little box of postcards in a gallery in Cambridge and came across some postcards with Matisse's settings of Ronsard on them. Recognised the drawings immediately as being by Matisse. Um, wondered what the poems were, was very intrigued, bought the postcards. I've, I've actually got them uh, just right here. Here they are. Complete with blue tack marks from where they were stuck on my <laughs> student wall. And um, and discovered later that uh, they were from a book that, that he had an illustrated poetry um, and just sort of consigned that to you know, interesting fact about Matisse. Later on discovered Matisse's, um, another book of Matisse, Jazz, which is the one you can see in the, on the right hand side of the picture that's showing at the moment. Um, that was through my studies at Cambridge. Um, I did a course on colour with um, John Gage, who was really a, a pioneer in the study of, of colour in modern art. Um, and then years later, when I came to ULIP looking to do some sort of postgraduate research that would actually consolidate my credentials as a literary translator, um, knowing that I was also always very interested in um, the relationship between poetry and literature, and that was something that I had also done as an undergraduate thesis at, at Cambridge. Um, I thought of Matisse's Ronsard and eventually came to the idea of a thesis that would look at how, um, if one was to try and translate Ronsard, how would Matisse's visual setting influence um, the translator's choices? And that was really what the, the thesis was about, um, which is obviously nothing at all what, what the book is about. But that research took me then to discovering this entire corpus um, of books that Matisse had done, and also to a realisation of how um, little known they were, uh, even among art historians, really, um, because they are such limited edition, very private things, you know, in, in, in private collectors. Um, personal libraries and and or or in occasional you know public libraries in the heritage collections of public libraries um, and that was where I was able to consult um, consult them in Paris at the, the Bibliothèque Jacques Doucet which is just opposite the Pantheon um, part of the Sorbonne Library. Yeah. And they hold um, a large number of of the books um, which were given by Matisse to to that collection and dedicated um, by him and signed. Um, and uh, that, that was where I 
had the great pleasure of sitting and, and looking through most of them. Yeah, I wanted to ask you actually because I realised I didn't know. I've never, we've never had that. I've never asked you that question. How many of them have you have you actually held the Hansard in your hand, an original print of? Uh, not, not actually the original Hansard because I uh, that does exist in a, a sort of mass market facsimile edition. Right. So I, I was working from that. I, I have held in my hand the. Um, the Pacifié, which is the, the Greek style play by his contemporary, um, the writer Henri de Montferland, uh, which is illustrated with beautiful black and white lino cut illustrations, which we saw just now. Um, that one I've, I've, I've held. Also, um, uh, Dessin Temi Variation, which is a, a, a great portfolio um, book of drawings, 150 odd drawings that was brought out at the beginning of the war. Um, Jazz I actually have in a facsimile that was published by Thomas and Hudson um, not long ago. Uh, so I've probably held about, seen about half of them. Um, also the Charles d'Orléans um, with, with the transcribed poems um, and, and crayoned decorations. Um, that's, that's, I think, the biggest physically of the books. And that one is, is beautiful, um, immersive sort of manuscript type um, thing to, to, to handle and look at. Yeah. I'm sort of insisting a little bit on this idea of the handling because on the one hand I you know definitely want to just remind as much myself and also say to, to, to those of you listening that Louise did some really incredible translations of Hansard that was part of the, the work of, for the M Phil. I mean you know really uh, they, it was just a really fascinating process to see that kind of that the, 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 the attention to the image in you know sort of shaping the translation process as well. So that, you know, that facsimile that sat there on the desk as we talked about those poems and the settings around the poems, I remember it very clearly. And um, But I'm also kind of slightly drawing attention to the, the holding of the books because I think, you know, you write in such an extraordinary way of the physical books that Matisse produced. And one of the things that's so nice about this volume, you know, uh, your way of writing about the books, but also the way this volume does give as much as is possible in a kind of standard, standardized, printed, you know, sort of mechanically printed volume. Um, but it does give a real feel for the books. And I think one of the really nice decisions that I just wanted to share with the audience is the fact of including the achevé d'imprimé, the information about the, the actual printing process. And so I want to just read the, uh, the extract from that that you've translated into English that describes how the, the printing process, the paper and so on, for the Florilège des Amours de Rossard, so the, the one that you worked on most with me in facsimile form. So it says, Paris, Albert Skira, 1948, lithographs on cream vélin d'arche, each page 38.1 by 29.2 centimetres, 15 by 11 and a half inches. 126 original lithographs, hand pulled on the presses of Mourlot Frères, Paris. Typography in 20-point William Caslon type by master printer Georges Girard. 320 copies on tinted, mould-made, wove arche paper numbered as follows. 20 copies numbered 1 to 20 with 12 original lithographs on Japon Imperial, pulled, numbered and initialed by the artist. And eight original lithographs on Japon Imperial, of which 50 copies were each were pulled, numbered and initialed by the artist. 30 copies numbered 21 to 50 with eight original lithographs on Japon Imperial, of which 50 copies were each not pulled, numbered and monogrammed by the artist. 250 copies numbered 51 to 320 non-commercial copies for the artist, publishers and collaborators. Printing completed on 29th of November 1948. All copies assigned by the artist and publisher and the stones were ground down after printing. And I think it's that, you know, that's the stones being ground down, the sense, the way that text gives such a sense of the, uh, you know, the, the, the labour of this printing process. And then this addition of the signature and the hand of the artist and, um, and just the, the kind of, you know, the, 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 that combination of the, uh, the, the collective nature of this work and then the individual stamp or monogram of the artist. And I just, you know, wanted you to say a little bit more about about that as a kind of as as what this object, this book is, and what its what its destiny, what its kind of trajectory out into the world is as well. Where mm. these books have gone. 
Um, well, a, a lot of them have gone um, into private hands and, and have remained there, um, and which is why they, you know, they, they aren't much, much seen, um, obviously. And um, I think the photograph that we can see there um, from, from the retrospective at the Swan of Pompidou um, gives you an idea of also the difficulty of displaying these, these books um, for, for a, a wider public. Um, each book there is is open at just one page, rather tantalisingly, and you you know you, you you have to imagine turning through the book yourself. Um, uh, one of one of the extraordinary things about looking at the books in the library is that uh, yes, you know you, because they're print rather than manuscript, they're not necessarily considered as you know particularly rare or precious. And I didn't have to put gloves on to handle them, for example, and. Um, you're sitting there in the library with a, a, a book that's been signed by Matisse. Um, you know, there's his handwritten signature in front of you. You, you. you know that copies of same, you know, have sold at auction for tens, if not hundreds of thousands, you know, quite recently. And yet you're free just to sit there and sort of leaf through it <laughs> quite happily, um, provided you don't, you know, write in pen, obviously, uh, that kind of thing. So that, that's, that's an extraordinary um, feeling. Um, I think that the, what the, the colophon that you just read also indicates the, the size of the books, particularly the florilege, I think, which is, which is very big. It's almost the size of a, an old um, broadsheet newspaper. And reading it is, is a very um, immersive experience. Um, and actually, if we could just see, uh, sorry, I'm just checking, picture number 12 um, shows a page from the, the Malarmé. Uh, in which there's a, a Matisse's drawing of, of, of a hand. I hope you can see that. Um, yes, there it is. Uh, that hand is, is um, it relates to Mallarmé's poem, um, La de la Mer Repos, which describes a, um, a Chinese artist um, drawing a very calligraphic landscape on a piece of porcelain, and that's what Matisse is illustrating there. Um, but that hand is, is actually life size, really, in the, in the size of the book. And when you're turning the pages yourself, you know, your, your own hand, the reader's hand actually comes and, and joins that hand very much in a similar pose almost and, and turns the page. And, and so, it, it, you know, you, you become engaged in, the, in the, the making of the performance of the book, if you like. And, and that's something that is really carried over into the Ronsard, which is um, bigger again. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's really a very large thing. And... Um, it's full of um, bits of women's bodies being also, you know, breasts, um, hips, arms, hands, whatever, lips, and they're all really life size. Um, and you, the reader, are, are turning through these pages. Um, and uh, at one point, there's a description Ronsard describes um, turning his sleeping lover um, from her stomach over onto her back. Um, and you turn the page, and as you do so, you come upon a life-size drawing of the, the lower half of the model's torso, sort of spread across the page. Um, and so you, you know, the reader, have actually engaged in this, in, in, in the physicality of what Ronsard is describing. Um, and that is something that Matisse makes happen, if you like, in, in, in the form of the, the Codex book, which necessitates turning pages. Um, and I think that's obviously something that you can't capture other than by sitting down with the book yourself, which is which is a, a rare privilege. <laughs> it is indeed. And it, is, it just you know, connects right back with the feelings that are the way in which this has been offering me these kind of moments of reprieve from our contemporary moment over these past few, you know, these past couple of weeks. And on that, I just want to say as well, because, you know, that's my my role, but it's also, again, a, you know, a great joy to do it, is just to say that every time I've read your descriptions um, and then I've turned to the page number and the book is beautifully done in that respect because it constantly tells you where to go to see the image that's being described. So I'm moving yes. backwards and forwards through the book. Yes, there's a lot of page turning required, actually. <laughs> a lot of page turning, but, but it's a really, you know, it's a very pleasurable process. And every time I've seen exactly what you've been describing, I've just sort of, you know, I've, I've been prepared to see and I've and then I've seen. And it's just a really, you know, it, it's it's a very, uh, a very pleasing experience to read you and then to look 
and then to go back to what you're saying. And I do think that that kind of that this long process of immersion that this work has taken you into has enabled you to have this kind of clarity and deftness in the way in which you describe um, describe these, these these works. And it's it's just a very wonderful thing. Well, the, um, the designers um, of the book were Sarah Prale and Christina Twig at, at Thames and Hudson, and they really did a fantastic job. Um, we, we wanted to keep the pictures in sequence um, as they are in, in the original books. And so um, the pictures that illustrate each of my chapters are in sequence. And then at the end of each chapter, there's a, a bigger um, set of reproductions, which are also in sequence. And so as, as near as possible, we've tried to, to keep them um, the, the flow of the pictures um, as, as a reader would experience them. Uh, and obviously getting, getting all of that to tie in as, as far as possible with my text. I think we went through five layouts um, to, to, to get there, <laughs> but, but, but we got there. Um, I think it, 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 it does work and all credit to them that, you know, the, the, way, the, the book, um, it, it works, you know, the page directions work and so on, which is a relief because the readers could have got a bit lost, but I'm glad that you say that you didn't. Um. I didn't, I didn't at all. And I think it's just a really, you know, it is real, you know, all credit to everybody involved in this process. It's it's a challenge to make a book about books such as Matisse's books. And, <laughs> and really, I didn't, you know, while I am fascinated by the idea of feeling the paper and, you know, seeing the size, I'm also absolutely taken by this experience of encountering the book. So I really recommend it to everybody out there. Um, that, that being said, I think one of the other things that's so extraordinary about this work is we do get a sense of each of the individual volumes really clearly, and they're very different. I mean, there's, you know, they're, but at the same time, what this, what your volume does is allow us, I think, to see much more clearly how they all relate to one another. And there's something mm. very strange about the order in which these books appeared. And I think one of the great achievements of your more kind of analytical, the more kind of historical dimension that you brought to this work is that you enable us to see that there was in fact an incredible overlap um, in the creative process here. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the way these volumes overlap or speak to one another. And, you know, uh, that's- Sure. Yeah. The, um, the, well, the, I think part of the, the problem in the literature on the books to date has been that their, their creative genesis, if you like, has been obscured by their publication dates. Um, they they were published, um, two, three were published in the war itself. Um, the rest, um, their publication was on hold really until after the war. Um, but they, the, 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 the last book to be published in Matisse's lifetime, for example, the Charles d'Orléans was published in 1950, but it was actually the second of the wartime books that he worked on in um, 1942. Uh, so their, their sort of creative genesis um, hasn't really been acknowledged. Um, and that's something that, that comes out um, in a reading of the correspondence. Um, and I would just, I'll, I'll actually show you what I did. <laughs> this is um, the edition of, the, of Matisse's correspondence with Rouvert, which exists. Um, and this is my post-it note index, <laughs> which um, colour coded for, the, for each book. And so you get there an actual sort of visual impression of how the books overlap and how each one emerges in the sources um, and, and, where it, and where it is relatively in, in, in relation to Matisse's chronology through the war as well. Um, and so the dates that we give for the books in, in the book are the, the first year that each book emerges in, in the source material. So these letters with Rouvert, also um, the memoir of Matisse's assistant Lydia de Lectorskaya, um, uh, letters to his son Pierre, that kind of thing. So um, the first date given is the first year that the book is, is beginning to be a, a concrete project. And the last date given is the date on which it was actually published. Yeah. No. Um, and, and at various points in the war, notably later on in the war, he was really fielding about three books at once. Um, the Baudelaire, um, a, a, a book of letters by a, a Portuguese nun, um, Mariana Alcoforado, uh, also from the 17th, 18th century. Um, uh, also jazz, um, those three really overlap quite, quite significantly. Yeah, I know I find that really completely fascinating. And I think that through that, you know, when we see this, you know, 
three such radically different texts, one which he himself authored, one which is massively canonical, and one which, in fact, the Portuguese letters, which, in fact, he really does quite substantially reshape or certainly reframes, uh, even in terms of how he, you know, what he, what he puts on the title page. Perhaps you could say just a little bit more about that, the Portuguese letters and how it intersects with a, with a history of a wartime experience as well. Uh, yes, well, the, 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 the Lettres Portugaises um, are, uh, were really a, a, a publishing phenomenon in, in, in Europe. They were first appeared in the 18th century um, and were ostensibly written by um, a young Portuguese nun who had been forced into a convent by her father um, sometime, I think, before the French Revolution. Um, and who had an affair with a French officer who was fighting in the um, Iberian Peninsula Wars. Um, and he then goes back to France uh, and she sends him a, a series of impassioned letters, which he then shows around his circle in Paris. Um, so the story goes um, and is he is then urged by his friends to publish these 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 wonderful things. Which he which he does um, the and they were a, a huge sensation. They were published all over Europe. Um, Madame de Sévigné writes about them. She uh, lettre portugaise actually became a sort of stock phrase, meaning you know in impassioned um, love letters, if you like, um, sort of the the eighteenth century equivalent of a torch song, that kind of thing. Um, and um, they enjoyed a, a resurgence of popularity for, for some reason in France in, in the war. And Matisse and Rivère had been talking about them um, in, the, in their letters. And uh, eventually Matisse um, produces a, a, an edition of them in which he uh, prefaces each letter with a, a, a frontispiece, which is a, a, a big sort of cascading frond, um, that motif that we're very familiar with from the later cutouts. That's actually where they, they first appear. Um, also a portrait of, of a supposed portrait of, of the nun herself, um, for which uh, actually the, the model was the adolescent daughter of a local Russian shopkeeper in, in Simiers. <laughs> Uh, because the nun herself was meant to be extraordinarily young when, when she wrote the, wrote the letters. Um, and Matisse brought this, this book out. Um, it happens, of course, that the letters are, are full of, of references to France at war and to, 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 to conflict on the continent of Europe. Um, Mariana is um, in enforced confinement in, in her convent. Um, and she she writes to, to her, her, her love of the French officer um, saying that she's heard nothing from him and, and that she hopes that he's safe. And so there's a lot in them that relates to Matisse's own situation. You know, he was terribly worried at the time about his daughter, Marguerite, for example, who, who was arrested by the Gestapo at the end of the war. He had no news from her, didn't know where she was. Um, that kind of thing. Um, it, it later scholarship on the letters suspects that they might actually just be an epistolary novel written by the French officer himself. But Matisse doesn't want to take that that angle. He he insists on the real existence of, of the Portuguese nun. Um, she was actually a real person. Um, and um, as as uh, Rouvert says in a in a letter to Matisse when the book comes out, he he really has reinstated her as a a very real. Um, passionate person working through a, a, an emotional process um, in the letters. Uh, and, and that's something that comes out very strongly in um, Matisse's decorations for, for, for the book as well. It's, it's a book that hasn't been given a lot of attention, um, but which Aragon actually writes at one point saying that he feels he should have given it more attention and, and it, uh, it does deserve um, it does deserve a look. The, the decorations are wonderful. I'm afraid we haven't got any pictures of them, but but, but they're in the book. <laughs> Absolutely, they're in the book, and I do think it's one of the things that's you know that's very surprising in the book is 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 this um, this slightly odd text which looks like a kind of you know almost like popular literature that suddenly kind of takes on this new dimension through the pictures and then takes on this new dimension through your way of writing about it as well with the intersection with the situation of his daughter. And perhaps what it enabled me to see a little bit more clearly is the way in which all of these, you know, there are so many portraits of women 
Um, you know, even the, the very sort of the facial portraits in the Baudelaire. And in a way, the, these, these faces of women feel like they're both quite constrained by the page. You know, they fill the page, they go right to the edge of the page. And so I think that this word that is obviously the word that is on the tip of our tongue all the time at the moment of confinement, of confinement, <laughs> of kind of, you know, of being closed in. And, um, and the, uh, you know, I, I think that the pictures are very evocative of that moment of that sense of possibility of imprisonment and of confinement. And at the same time, there's something about the dynamic nature of the drawing that means that they sort of explode away and off the page as well. And I wonder if you could just share something about the way in which you've thought about that, that sort of the use of the page and the line on the page, because I do think it's, you write about it so brilliantly, so. Well, in the, in the particular portraits of, of Mariana, um, the striking thing about them is that she's she's veiled, um, uh, not in not in our modern uh, multicultural sense, but uh, as a as a nun, um, and so her face is surrounded in each case by this swirl of, of folds of drapery, which, as you say, reaches out to all the corners of the page and and um, very much centres our attention on her features, um, and which also means that there's there's nothing apart from her features visible. You can't see her hair, you can't see her hands. And the, the emotional expressivity that Matisse packs into those, those very reduced portraits is, is, is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Um, um, also in the, um, the Mallarmé, for example, which we can see the, we can see the, still see the hand here. Um, Maybe we might see um, a different picture, number three, perhaps, um, from the from the Mallarmé. Uh, the 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 etchings, which is what Matisse used to to illustrate the Mallarmé, the 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 lines are so thin and fine. Um, they really look like there we are. They really look like cobwebs of of lines spreading across the the, the page, really, um, and. The, the Malame was commissioned by um, the publisher Skira um, as a pendant to a book that he had brought out slightly beforehand by Picasso, um, an illustration of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, and if you look at that book, Picasso, uh, all the pictures are, are very tightly bound in a, a frame in the middle of each page, surrounded by lots of empty white space. And inside that very tight frame, Picasso's figures sort of clamber over each other and, and sort of turn around and, and try to get out, if you like. And Matisse obviously wants to do something completely different. And, and, and as you can see here, this, you know, this, this is what he does. He's, he, and Mallarmé himself is also, um, as a pioneer of artists' books and, and of experimental poetry that, that itself engages with the, the, the shape of the page. Um, he's acutely conscious, something that he's acutely conscious of as well, and something that Matisse celebrates really through, throughout this, this, this book. Yeah, that's great. I wonder if we could, I don't know which the, the numbers are of the photos, but it would be really wonderful if we could pull up the Charles d'Orléans one again. Louise, do you know the number for the Charles d'Orléans one? Uh, which, which one are you thinking of? The one of the portrait, the profile picture of the Charles d'Orléans. In 9D. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's coming. Where he just looks. That's yeah. it. Back one. Can we go back one? Um, well, here. This is also a really nice one from the Charles d'Orléans. But the other one is the disgruntled Charles himself, which just looks like yeah. such a kind of like you know. It's such a moment for me that yeah, this one here. That that face looking in at his own work almost. So this kind of this strange mm -hmm. sense, I think that you know, that's just so uh, so sort of fascinating on this page of you know of sort of distance and looking looking towards this this book from some sort of yes. outside. And um, and it's just such a yes. fantastic sort of image of of disconsolate uh, kind of. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's a wonderful picture, and there are. Um, numerous studies, rejected studies for it that exist, um, in which you, you really get the measure of quite how fine the, the finished portrait is. Some of them are, are, are rather comical looking and, and just really don't, simply don't work. Um, this one, he, he, he looks so, you know, sort of image of contained fury, I think really, in, 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 in the picture. And, and there is this sense of him looking into the book, you know, he's looking to the right. Um, and in the Ronsard, for example, there is the same 
format for the frontispiece, Ronsage looking into the book, and at the very end of the book, um, one of his muses or Matisse's models is, is in a, um, a, a mirror profile portrait looking back towards the book. Um, actually in, in, a, in a, with an expression, I think in the wrong side, of a certain amount of dismay at all the, <laughs> at quite what's gone on um, up to that point. Um, but, but yes, there's this, this sense of the, the, the journey of the book and, and you know, through the pages, um, which is anticipated in each case in the, in the title page of, of which this is a, a very, very fine example. Yes, it's, it's true. Yeah, and on that before, because I mean, I, we have to, we have to ask the question about the way the, the representation of the women in these and some of what you were saying earlier about this kind of perhaps slightly shock, shocking way in which Hansard comes over as this quite coercive lover. And I want to come back to some of that eroticism, but first, in, because we're looking at this picture of Charles d'Orléans and you've just been talking about this kind of almost mirror image that Matisse gives for himself, just to hear you a little bit about that, how Baudelaire figures in the, um, you know, and how some of the male figures that are both kind of mirror images and and companions almost. Yeah, I think we have a really strong sense of the sort of companionship with some of these male figures that, that are, you know, marginal presences through these volumes. Um, mm. yeah. Well, um, Baudelaire actually is, is portrayed um, in the Mallarmé. He's, he's um, uh, we, we don't have a picture of it sadly, but there's, it's a very famous, um, line drawing of, of Baudelaire um, based on that rather hypnotic photograph of him that was taken by Nadar, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and Baudelaire's, you know, piercing gaze, which Matisse, Matisse's drawing absolutely magnifies to, to an incredible extent. Um, and, and the Malame collection includes a, um, a, a, a tribute to Baudelaire. It's called the Tombeau de Baudelaire, the poem. Um, and so Baudelaire is very much there in, in that, um, in that book, and then obviously in 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 his own collection, the Fleur du Mal, which is what Matisse illustrates. Um, and I think that that sort of penetrating gaze of Baudelaire, if you like, is something that Matisse feels he he really can't duck because we we remember too that Baudelaire was the author of um, a series, a very famous series of reviews of the Paris salons. Um, in which he expresses his his immense exasperation at academic French art mm. and the, the the dullness and sterility of it, and 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 he calls famously for paintings of modern life, um, um, which is really the the clarion call that then rallies the whole of sort of French independent art in the late nineteenth century and the twentieth century. And so Matisse, you know, cannot but acknowledge the you know, the central role of Baudelaire in, in the genesis of his own entire, you know, painted oeuvre, if you like. And, and so I think Baudelaire is, is very much a, a presiding genius to, to that extent. Um, Charles d'Orléans, I think, is, is really the, 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 the intimate, comforting companion of, of, of life through dark and difficult times. His, his poems are, are wonderfully intimate and, and um, offer extraordinary moral support, I think. Um, it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's quite hard to describe their, their tone, but they're, 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 they're colloquial and so pithy and, and direct um, and so piercingly honest and, and piercing of um, hypocrisy as well. Um, and I think that was something that Matisse found morally very comforting um, through, through, through the war years. Um, Ronsa, I think there's really a um, a sense of Matisse using him as a sounding board um, through which to examine his own relationship with the model. Mm. Um, the whole of the Ronsard book is is um, about his 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 successive um, loves, his amour, uh, who are all well known to French readers. There's um, Cassandre, Hélène, Marie, um, and you know Matisse is is, is looking at, at the the male female relationship in art, um, the model muse, the you know the um, the, the the poet artist um, on you know, um, as as kind of opposing sides or um, collaborators really in in, in an endeavour. Yeah, um, I think that's something that he's examining in in the in the Ronsard book um, very very clearly. Okay, that's great. So it brings us back to this, you know, the vexed question of the male artist and the female model, which we will come back to. I just want to kind of like 
uh, partly relay one of the questions that's been put out there, which is quite simply, you know, saying I may have missed this, but how many books did Matisse create? Um, so, Louise. Oh, well, yeah, actually, a great many more than, than I write about. Um, the, the full catalogue of, of Matisse's books um, was drawn up by his grandson um, uh, in the late 1980s, I think. Um, and it lists books where you know Matisse contributed a frontispiece or, or just a handful of illustrations. Um, but what and, and there there are a great many. But what what I'm writing about specifically is the books where Matisse engages with um, an existing literary um, work or his own writing um, and and creates um, very much a, a a new work of art in its own right. Um, and I think that. In, in that definition, there are really eight, um, and those are the eight that I that I write about in the, in the book. In the Matisse, the books, which again, I'm just going to show the book. Here it is, the Matisse <laughs> books, which covers the eight books and they're in sequence in the book. So this is also to say to anybody who wants to ask any questions, please do post them in the Q&A now and I'll try and relay them across to, to Louise. But before, as you are posting your questions, I want to also kind of draw attention, or the, the, the pictures are, uh, are flicking forward, but I wanted to actually catch the way in which um, in the Charles d'Orléans book as well, again, one of the kind of really extraordinary things that's worth sort of taking time to observe is the way in which Matisse makes the fleur de lys the symbol of kind of royalist France. And so in some ways, you know, just like a really yeah, a symbol that I didn't expect myself to have the great interest in, I have to admit, but it becomes completely alive and he does all sorts of amazing things with it. So again, at the risk of kind of appearing to kind of elude the question of the male artist and the female model, which is obviously so structural in these works, um, I do want to sort of like draw attention and, and ask Louise as well to kind of just sort of go, come back over the way in which some of the, the, the more abstract forms work here, because I think one of the really great things that we learn from this work is the extent to which the, the extraordinary kind of formal revolution that comes with the cutouts and this kind of whole new kind of idiom of imagery that emerges in that last phase of creativity for Matisse actually has its origin, as you've just said, in some of these line drawings that are that are emerging through these these books. And um, mm. and I find it so fascinating to be able to see that process. So perhaps something uh, well, about the fruit, the fleur de lis, and so on. You know. Uh, well, the fleur de lis are are um, uh, very significant in um, actually. If we could uh, let me call up the picture, the, the particular picture. Um, where are we? we? Picture 9E. <laughs> um, the uh, Matisse first uses the, the, the fleur de lis um, in an edition, um, the, the neck there, that one. Um, Matisse first uses the fleur de lis in, for the cover, a very famous cover of um, an art review called Verve that was published um, just before the um, Nazi invasion of France um, in September. 1939, um, Matisse um, produced this very famous cover for it, which is in the vitrine at, at the Centre Pompidou, um, along with all the other books um, that, that you saw in the photograph there. Um, it's it's jet black and um, little fleur-de-lis are stuck onto the black in paper cutout um, in very vivid, bright sort of rainbow colours. And so there's a sense of this symbol of France glowing in the darkness and and sort of floating about and in Matisse's paintings um, black very often represents I think the unknown and the unknown future and and also a, a, a slight sense of jeopardy in, in the face of that um, and he he produced this cover uh, literally um, in, in September 1939 and then immediately fled Paris um, and went on a great tour de France down through the Basque country and across the, the, the south coast back to Nice, um, uh, fleeing the, the, um, the Nazi invasion, literally. Um, and so his use of the fleur de lis in the Charles d'Orléans harks back to that very famous um, cover of, of Verve. Um, and they are a, a symbol of France, but I think they're also partly a, a reason why that, that Charles d'Orléans book has, has often been misunderstood. Um, as simply a rather patriotic um, statement about, about French culture, but it, it, it's a very great deal more than that. Um, 
and the, the the pages of fleur de lis through the book are very much its its emotional barometer you know sometimes they look like blood-stained daggers sometimes they look like fluttering leaves or, or um autumn leaves or, or or you know whatever um and here this particular spread um it's a poem by Charles d'Orléans uh, on the previous page, I think, which um, addresses um, a, an unknown woman, a, a, a lover, but who is also um, France, um, as, as becomes clear from the poem. And, and it's also Charles d'Orléans writing, as I said, from the Tower of London in exile, um, you know, thinking of his homeland. Um, and here we have the fleur de lis in, in red, white, and blue as as you know the national colours, which which Matisse often writes about and comments on in his letters and, and in his his commentary on his own work. Um, and the woman who's looking at them, if if we look carefully at the picture, we see that there are two of her. She's she's black and she's also drawn in red, and she's a kind of palimpsest. And the, the the feeling that you get when you read that, and when you particularly also, the, the, this is a book which unusually um, is, a lot of the pictures are, are dated. Um, so we see that it's very much in the war. It's 1941, it's 1942. Um, and, and I think she is France uh, split and, and this, this sort of twofold um, presence, the, you know, the, the, the so-called free Vichy zone and the occupied zone and, and the, the sort of two mentalities that that, that that then came to be crystallized as, you know, the, the resistant and the collabo you know, after the war. Um, and I think that that kind of um, split personality, if you like, is, is there in that picture of, of, of um, this, this woman looking at the, the, the national fleur de lis. Um, and that's these are some of the messages, the very political messages that are articulated in the in the wartime books. Um, well, thanks so much. Now we've got a couple of um, really great questions here that I want to share. First one for Madeleine Pigot. Pigot uh, I'm not sure whether that's a French or an English name. In any case, saying that you know she herself has worked on Michel de Montaigne's essays illustrated by Dali, and she's kind of noting um, a particular interest in these kind of literary art collaborations. In the, in the 1940s and 1950s. I wonder if you have anything to say about the broader context of this, of this turn to the book form, the extent to which that might be a phenomenon of the privacy of the, the, the kind of closing in of life during the war, or is there something, are there other factors that, are, that you feel you can identify that suggest a reason? Well, I, I think the, the, the privations of the war um, are a factor, definitely. Um, you know, in, in, in the letters with Rouvert, the shortage of, of materials is, is quite obvious. Mm. Um, in Matisse's case, um, you know, working on the books was something that he could do in, in, in bed, and as, as, we, as we see in, in, in the photograph that, that, that came up earlier. Um, uh, so I think in his case, you know, it was very much a product of that, of, of the kind of enforced confinement that, 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 that he was subject to. Um, for other artists, I, I, I wouldn't really venture to think why, other than that, yes, I think, you know, as we're all finding now, um, uh, lockdown, if you like, does does make you look to more, more private um, art forms such as the book, yes. Um, okay, thank I you. Think I, that, uh, I, was, I, I wanted to pick up with that question a little bit to bring it up to date in a way. So I will get back to Joseph's question in just a minute, but before I do that, just to ask what, I mean, I think there's a real resurgence in interest today as well in, in the book form, in the in the livre d'artistes. And it's very interesting that the Pompidou has chosen to organize this major anniversary exhibition Mm, presumably absolutely. conceived long before any prospect of lockdown or confinement, but nonetheless it seems that there is a kind of interest today in that, in the livre d'artiste. Um, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts on why there's this turn back or this this bibliophilia uh, that's re-emerging today. Oh, well, I think, um, you know, our, our, our almost, you know, 100% dependence on digital media makes us celebrate the, the paper book. Mm -hmm. 
and and that that you know that act of looking and reading that isn't on a screen actually um i i think people are you know celebrating that um in my wearing my hat as a as a translator um there's a, a wonderful um very small publishing company in london les fugitives um who <clears throat> publish um a fantastic series of books combining artwork and, and texts and they've they've done um some work by Louise Bourgeois and, and various other people. They actually have a, a list um, under the heading ekphrasis, in other words, um, you know, art that can be explored in, in, in different media. Um, you know, the, 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 the carrying over, the, literally the translation, if you like, of, of, of one art form in, in, into another. Um, and they, they've published a, a number of books on, on, on that, um, on that theme and um in paris there's obviously of course there's the the cahier collection that's published um uh out of the out of the american university uh which similarly celebrates um you know beautifully produced words and pictures together um and it, it's 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 definitely something that's enjoying a resurgence now yes yeah, i think something that kind of the again this idea of the sort of slowing down of the holding of the object in the hand as opposed yeah. to the screen that kind of you know where things yes. multiply and slip away from us on that let's uh, you know turn to Joseph's question here and I, I think this is a really lovely question are Matisse's paper cutting skills also evident in the poems that he cut out from the printed works ah that's <laughs> I thought you'd be interested that's by that question <laughs> that's a really interesting thought um I think that it, it sounds almost trite to say that, you know, paper, if you like, is, is the elephant in the room here. You know, the, the books are all on paper, the, 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 the printing processes, which are, which are very physical, um, are, are on paper and the paper cutouts are on paper. Um, and what I think Matisse achieves through the, um, the work on the books is um, the transformation of the, the the line that you see on on paper in the books and and the the, the very physical feeling for line which printmaking gives you actually um, he 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 transforms that in the paper cutouts into actually cutting line directly into color um, and each of the paper cutouts, uh, if, you, if you look at the different motifs, notably the, the, the famous seaweed fronds, for example, each one of them is a continuous line, um, which he actually makes with those huge shears that he, that he, that he used, which you see in photographs and, and in films. Um, but, you know, they, they are the, 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 the transposition of line, if you like, from the page into just shapes of, of, of pure colour. Um, and the, the paper cutouts are all about line. And I do think that the physicality of, of the making of the books definitely um, was a catalyst for that. Yes, I actually hadn't thought of the, the, the cutting up of the, the text um, to make his, his page layouts as, as part of that, but obviously it is, yes, um, very much so. And you emphasise quite, in, you know, in, I think really justly and very interestingly in the book as well, the way in which he, he, he moved the pages around and hung them on the walls and lived around kind of, you know, the, the, the book as a series of pages and then shuffled them around. There's a, one description, I think, in a letter to Rouvert again, where he's, he says, you know, from six o'clock this morning, I've been moving these pages around. So I think when, yes. you, you know, when you say that the paper is the elephant in the room, it was very much the, the element in the room as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, absolutely. The, um, the, 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 the Charles d'Orléans, um, basically he, Matisse was transcribing these poems and, and sending them to Rouvert uh, throughout sort of 1941 through to 1943. Um, and often Rouvert would write to Matisse, you know, with, he, was, he was suffering various woes and travails of his own, and Matisse would simply respond in character as Charles d'Orléans with a poem, and often for, you know, days at a time. So these transcribed poems existed, and Rouvert had them all on, on, on pieces of card, and, and so then when it came to making the book, it was a case of, as you say, um, you know, juggling them around, looking at what, what worked, um, and um, what eventually happens is that the book follows a, a calendar year. So it begins with um, 
Charles' descriptions of spring and Valentine's Day and Easter and summer um, through, to, through, to, through to winter and full as as were Charles's original poems of coded language, if you like, re relating to, to the war. And the book um, begins with a picture which is dated, I think, 1943. And so it's tempting when you when you're looking through it to, to see the sequence of poems as a kind of um, account with hindsight of the late years of the war, starting from that date. Um, Charles, for example, writes a poem about um, the coming of summer visitors in inverted commas, if you like, and, and this is clearly a reference to um, discussions between Matisse and Rivera about the possibility of the Allied landings on the on the, on the south coast, um, that kind of thing. It, um, and that's something that livres d'artistes, I think, lend themselves to as well. This rather coded, private, almost sort of subliminal um, means of communication through the interaction of the words and pictures. Um, rather than stating things out uh, outright. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that brings us back really kind of beautifully as perhaps as a kind of way of closing as well, because we've run over slightly on the time that we intended um, to these questions of translation and to this idea of, yeah, of the kind of, of the implicit meaning that your work has done, has you know, has draws out and, and helps us kind of um, exist, uh, exist amongst and around and see through these works. So we've kind of, again, slightly eluded this question of the male artist and the female model. Um, <laughs> but I think that uh, everything that you've said here this evening, you know, just is, is so, gives us such a strong sense of how complex a construction this is and that kind of by zooming in on one particular construction, we're only going to, we're going to miss this, this really um, uh, intricate, compelling and, and, and intensely clever um, and pleasing also kind of montage and, and construction that we have here. I'm tempted to ask you, Louise, some thoughts about the exhibition, but maybe I'll just end by saying that the exhibition exists. Um, but for this audience, in this context, the exhibition is uh, definitely worth the visit if it's possible, but perhaps in these days, these dark days of limited travel and limited movement, um, there is first and foremost this wonderful book <laughs> which will give you a world to be in. And um, I can't recommend it enough. And I can't thank you enough, Louise. I don't know if you have any thank final you. comments that you'd like to uh, share. And otherwise, I think we've answered people's questions. And I hope people have enjoyed listening to you, because I certainly have. Well, I, th I think the, um, the, you know, the, 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 I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to bring the, this, this amazing body of, of Matisse's work to, to a wider audience through the books. So I think this is the first time that so many of their illustrations have been gathered together in one volume with so much of the texts that accompanied them so that we, we do have a sense of them, not just as albums of prints, but 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 as visual and, and textual narratives um, in their own right. And, and uh, I think that's really the, the message that he, he was a, a most extraordinarily sensitive reader of poetry um, and, and a, 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 a the way he captures um, his sense of, of, of the texts that, that he illustrates um, in these extraordinary sort of graphic equivalents and, and graphic commentaries on the text that he, that he illustrates is, is a really fascinating thing to, to, to delve into. Well, thank you, Louise, and you really have delved and you brought it up for us. <laughs> thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we will say good night to everybody or, you know, thank you everybody uh, for good listening. evening to those who are an hour out of sync with us in Paris. And thank you, Louise. Bye bye. Thank you very much.